A lot of guitarists avoid learning the notes on the fretboard for some reason, and that's too bad because it unlocks significantly faster progress, especially with learning songs. It's also essential to learning to improvise. I know this personally because I played guitar for about 30 years before I learned all the notes on the fretboard, and I really regret that I didn't do it sooner. So this video is about how I would learn the notes if I had to do it over again, and it's just as much for intermediate players looking for some ways to speed up their recall as it is for beginners who are learning this for the first time. I'll show you what worked best for me, which includes three different ways to think about the fretboard, and I'll give you four great exercises that will help you mix it up to practice this material efficiently. Even if you already know the notes, these exercises will help you build up recall speed, which is a key to becoming a better improviser. If you already know the theory parts, you can just skip to the exercises. So from my experience, here's the short version of why it's worth learning the notes on the fretboard in the first place. Number one, it's gonna help you communicate with your bandmates. A few years ago, I was playing in a cover band and I had learned all the guitar parts from tab, basically just memorizing where my fingers needed to go. At one point during a rehearsal, the bass player wanted to check that he was playing the right note, so he asked me what chord I was playing. My answer was more or less a blank stare. The second reason is that it'll help you learn new material much faster. It does this by allowing you to see triads and scales as meaningful groups, and it helps you understand the musical language of what you're playing. I'll say more on this later. Number three is the big one for me. Quick recall of note names is essential for improvisation, but maybe not quite in the way that you'd think. One of the most fundamental skills in improvisation is being able to quickly find the root of an upcoming chord near wherever your fingers are. I plan to do a series of videos on learning to improvise, so stay tuned for more on that. So those are the high-level reasons. Now let's take a look at three different ways to think about the fretboard. Here's the Cliff Notes version. The guitar fretboard is a grid that allows you to move in three directions, horizontally, vertically, and diagonally. If you move up and down the neck horizontally, you move in one semitone increments, which corresponds to the chromatic scale. If you move from string to string, you mostly move in jumps of five semitones, which corresponds to the cycle of fourths or fifths. And there are a small number of patterns, sort of like chess moves, that allow you to make a leap of a full octave to land on the exact same note you started on. These three facts give you all the tools you need to memorize the fretboard efficiently. And you don't need to understand the meaning of any of the terms I'm using to be able to do this, but I will explain all the pieces as clearly as I can. I tend to move quickly and cram a lot of useful information into my videos, so if you ever find yourself scrambling to take notes or wishing that you had a quick way to refresh your memory, you can purchase printable cheat sheets to go along with my videos at the link in the video description. Your purchases go a long way toward helping me continue to develop new content, so thank you. And please be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons and leave a comment to tell me what topics you'd like me to cover in future fret science videos. Let's start with horizontal movement. On a piano, the natural notes, C, D, E, F, G, A, and B, correspond to the white keys, and the chromatic notes fall on the black keys. A black key that's just to the right of a white key gets a sharp added to its name, and a black key that's just to the left of a white key gets a flat added to its name. So each black key has two names that for our purposes are completely equivalent. There are no black keys between B and C or between E and F. So the chromatic scale is C, C sharp or D flat, D, D sharp or E flat, E, F, F sharp or G flat, G, G sharp or A flat, A, A sharp or B flat, and B. There are 12 notes in all, which then repeat over and over in a cycle. On a guitar string, these notes are all arranged in a line and in this order. And this is why the guitar usually has a special marker at the 12th fret, and the markers on the first 12 frets are usually repeated on the upper frets. It's because everything above the 12th fret is an exact copy of the first 12. So we really only need to learn the names of the first 12 frets, and we get the upper frets for free. Since each change of one fret corresponds to moving one position in the chromatic scale, we can use this simple pattern to identify neighboring notes. In standard tuning, the open strings are tuned to E, A, D, G, B, E, and we can think of an open string as being like a zeroth fret. If we want to find the name of any note on the fretboard, we could start under the open string and move up the chromatic scale, naming the notes along the way. So here, if we wanted to know the note at the seventh fret of the G string, we start at G and we move one chromatic step per fret. G sharp, A, A sharp, B, C, C sharp, and finally D. 
And since we know the names of the open strings, we can do the same thing moving out from the 12th fret, or even the 24th if your fretboard goes that high. So let's say we wanted to know the name of this note. We know that the 12th fret of the E string is an E. One fret up from that is F, and then we get to F sharp. For this note, we can move down from the E. One fret down is E flat, then D, and finally D flat. For a little shortcut, we can use the fact that there are sharps and flats between some of the natural notes, so that sometimes we can move two frets at a time. Let's say we wanted to identify this note at the ninth fret of the D string. We can start at D, and we can skip over the sharps, so we jump to E. There's just one fret to F, two to G, two to A, and finally two to B. Of course, the same thing works moving down the neck as well. To identify this note, we could start at the G we know at the 12th fret, move two frets down to F, and then one to E. The point of this is that you don't have to memorize every location on the fretboard all at once. As long as you know the note of a nearby position on the same string, you can figure it out. It's not always the most efficient way, but it gets the job done. Now let's talk about vertical movement. Here we have the chromatic scale mapped to a circle, and we've seen that we can start on any note and easily move up and down the neck. The strings on a guitar in standard tuning are mostly tuned to be five semitones apart, which is a perfect fourth interval. If we start at a B note and move five semitones, we get an E note. Do it again, we get A. And if we keep moving in five semitone steps, we get D, G, C, F, B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat, G flat. And then finally, we get back to the B and the cycle repeats. This sequence is so important to get some name in music theory. It's called the circle of fourths, and it's one of the handful of sequences that's worth its weight in gold to memorize. Notice the subsequence EADG, which corresponds to the lowest four strings in standard tuning. And also notice that B is right before E, just like on the top two strings in standard, or the bottom two on a seven string guitar. The circle of fourths is used all over the place in music, starting with the fretboard itself. Since the strings are mainly tuned in fourths, most of the time when we move up to the next string, we move to the next note in the cycle of fourths. If we start at the B note at the seventh fret of the low E string, we just move through the cycle as we move across the strings. B, then E, A, and D. The only place this doesn't work is when we move between the G and B strings, which are tuned to be only four semitones apart instead of five. Understanding how that quirk affects patterns on the fretboard is so important that I made a whole video about it, which I highly encourage you to check out if you haven't seen it already. But for our purposes here, the main thing to know is that when you move along the cycle of fourths, you need to move diagonally when you cross this invisible line between the G and B strings that I call the warp. So here, if we move diagonally, we get a G note on the B string. And we can continue to move from string to string, moving along the cycle of fourths. So we get a C next. Since both the first string and the sixth string are tuned to E, that C copies over to the low E string. And then we can keep going with the cycle as long as we move diagonally when we cross the warp. We get F, B flat, E flat. We move diagonally and continue with A flat and then D flat. The D flat copies over and we continue with G flat. Now the cycle starts over again with B. You get the idea. Notice that as we did this, we built out a fragment of the chromatic scale on every string. On the low E string, we have B, C, and D flat. On the next string, E, F, and G flat, then A, B flat, and B, and so on. And obviously, we can use this cycle in reverse as well. Let's say we were starting at the F note on the 13th fret. If we move down to the next lower string, we move backwards along the cycle. F moves to C. We move diagonally to G and then continue on with D, A, and E. E copies over to the top string and we move once more to B. So from that one note, we figured out the names of all the open strings. So it turns out to be very useful to memorize the cycle of fourths sequence in both directions. As I've shown it here, it's the cycle of fourths going clockwise, B, E, A, D, G, C, F, and so on. And going counterclockwise, it's the cycle of fifths, F, C, G, D, A, E, B, and so on. For one more quick example, let's pretend that the only note we know for certain is the A on the open A string, and we want to figure out the names of the notes in this chord. We can move up the string using the chromatic scale, A, B, C, D, and E, and then move across strings using the cycle of fourths to A, which is the first note. 
then up a string to D, which is the second note. We move diagonally to G because of the warp, and then count back to F sharp for the third note. So we've covered horizontal and vertical movement. Now let's talk about diagonal movement. There are two main shapes that are useful for finding octaves. First, you can move up two frets and up two strings. For this specific example, since we started with D, we have E, A, and then back to D. Now this shape, two frets up and two strings up, can be moved anywhere on the fretboard, and the two positions will always be the same note. If this shape overlaps the warp, it becomes a three fret span because we have that extra diagonal move. These shapes work backwards too, so you can go down two frets and down two strings. Three frets if you cross the warp. The second useful pattern is to move up three frets and down three strings. Here we have a B which moves to a C and then D, and then down the strings to A, to E, and then back to B. If this shape crosses the warp, it becomes a two fret span. I have a whole video on how intervals work and how to find them anywhere on the fretboard, so check that out if this is at all confusing. Here's a summary. If we aren't crossing the warp, up two strings and over two frets is an octave, as is down three strings and up three frets. If we cross the warp, the first one becomes a three fret span, and the second one shrinks to two. With only these moves, we can easily find every place on the fretboard that you can play a particular note. Let's do it for the note C. If we start at the C on the first fret of the B string, we can move down three strings and up two frets to the C at the third fret of the A string. From there, up two strings and up two frets to the C at the fifth fret of the G string. From there, we can go up two strings and over three frets to the eighth fret of the high E string. Or we can go down three strings and over three frets to the eighth fret of the low E string. If we keep going, we get another C at the 10th fret of the D string, and then one more at the 13th fret of the B string, which is exactly 12 frets above where we started. These shapes are fantastic if you need to move large distances on the fretboard to identify a note. They can also be a crutch for identifying notes on the inner strings if you have only memorized, for example, the E and A strings. If you map out all the possible locations for a single note like this, it's worth noticing that there's a strong connection here to the caged system. In caged, you learn to move five open position chords, C, A, G, E, and D, around the fretboard, making a bar with your index finger. This is a really important mental model for navigating the fretboard, and I have a video that explains it in a lot more depth. Here's the super short version. Let's start with an open position C chord as a bar chord. The roots of the chord are shown in red, and they correspond to this octave move on the fretboard. Next, the A chord shape fits here, the G chord shape fits here, then we have the E chord shape, and finally the D chord shape. These root positions are the single most important concept in the caged system. Check out my other video for more on that. Before talking about the most efficient ways to practice identifying notes, and eventually learning them all by heart, I want to take a moment to discuss why it's so important to learn the notes of the fretboard in the first place. Because of the way the guitar is tuned, every scale, chord, and arpeggio forms a unique geometric shape that can be moved all over the fretboard. As you learn to play, you quickly start to notice certain fingering patterns that pop up in song after song. And each of those patterns contains one note that's more important than the others, that notes the root or the tonal center of the cluster of notes. If you can recognize the underlying pattern, and you know which note it's anchored to, that gives your brain a bigger chunk of knowledge to work with, which means you can hold more of the song in your head at one time. There's a really famous psychology result from the 1950s that says that our working memory is limited to holding only a handful of things in mind at once. This is a massive bottleneck, but there's a little bit of a loophole. It turns out that the key to keeping more information in mind at once is to encode that information in bigger chunks. If you learn a guitar solo as a series of scale patterns and positions rather than individual notes, you can learn larger sections more quickly, and knowing where the roots are inside those patterns is the key to placing them on the fretboard correctly, and also it's a key to reusing licks in different contexts. For improvisation, one of the most important skills is to be able to quickly find the roots of each chord as it's about to be played. There are many different ways to visualize the fretboard for improvisation. But one of the most commonly used methods is to start with an underlying pentatonic scale that fits with most of the chord progression, and then temporarily add in notes from each chord at just the right time as that chord goes by. That subject totally deserves its own video, so I'll leave it at that. 
But being able to find a particular note near wherever your fingers happen to be is one of the most important skills you can develop on guitar. Okay, so let's move on to how to practice this effectively. First, I believe there's no need to try to learn the whole fretboard all at once. And one of the best ways to stay motivated is to combine this practice with learning other things at the same time. So that's approach number one. As a specific example, you can combine this with practicing the pentatonic scale using my rectangle and stack method and focus on learning all of the locations of just one note. Let's say you're working on the E note and you want to work on the E minor pentatonic scale. Find an E note, play it with your ring finger, and play a stack there. Maybe expand the stack into the full pentatonic pattern. Slide up to another E and play a stack there. Do it again. Now switch to targeting an E with your index finger and play a rectangle there. Do it with another E. At this point, I've played parts of every E minor pentatonic shape across the entire fretboard. Mix things up. Try sliding into a different note in the pattern and walk up to the root, or make a musical phrase that resolves to the root. Keep moving to different spans of frets and do the same thing until it becomes easy to find an E under your fingers every time. Then move on to a different note. You can do the same thing for the major pentatonic scale, or for any of the modes for that matter. I've got a video about how to easily overlay the modes on the pentatonic scale, so check that out if you haven't already. Since a lot of guitar music is played in the keys of E, A, D, or G, learn those notes first. You'll need to find them more often than any of the other notes. Then maybe work your way around the rest of the cycle of fourths. The second approach I recommend, whenever you're learning a new song, memorize the sequence of chords and practice playing the chord progression as triads in different locations. Or just play the roots. Little Wing is a nice one to try because it covers all of the natural notes. Hendrix had his guitar tuned down a half step, but if we ignore that, the chord progression contains A minor, B minor, C, D, E minor, F, and G, with a B flat minor thrown in as a passing chord. So maybe challenge yourself to find chord voicings in a limited area. I like to do this on the top four strings in a five fret range. Let's do it here for frets six to 10. If we start with E minor, here's an E at the ninth fret of the G string, and we can build a minor triad around that. There's a G at the 8th fret of the B string, and we can build a major triad there. A's up here at the 10th fret of the B string. We go back down to the E. B's on the 7th fret of the E string. We can slide that down to B flat. We go back up to the A. There's a C at the 8th fret of the E string. Go back to our G. There's an F at the 10th fret of the G string. Go back to C. And then finally, we have a D at the 7th fret of the G string. It's one thing to do this one chord at a time, but for a bigger challenge, do it with a metronome or along with the recording. A third exercise is to focus on just one string at a time and use the cycle of fourths or fifths to visit each note in an order that keeps you moving. I'd start with the E string since you get two strings for the price of one. You can start anywhere in the cycle of fourths. I like to start with B and then find E, A, D, G, C, and F, since that covers all the natural notes. So here's B at the seventh fret, E's at the twelfth, A is at the fifth, D's at the tenth, G is at the third, C's at the eighth, and F's at the first. You can keep going and do the flats, but if you stop there, you've already covered the natural notes. And you can always just shift up or down by one fret to get the sharps and flats. But let's keep going. Here's the B flat at the sixth fret, E flats at the eleventh, A flats at the fourth fret, D flats at the ninth, G flats down at the second fret, and if we go one more, we get back to the B at the seventh fret. And you can mix things up a little and use the cycle of fifths to go in the other direction, F, C, G, D, A, E, and B, and so on. It's worth knowing the cycle of fourths and fifths backwards and forwards because both sequences end up being useful in lots of places. Once you have the hang of it, it's a good idea to not always start on the same note. 
Try closing your eyes and pick a random note with your fretting hand. Open your eyes, name that note, and then proceed through the entire cycle of fourths or fifths until you get back to where you started. Maybe practice doing this on a different string each day. In terms of what order to learn the other strings in, the A string is very useful as a place to visualize roots of bar chords, so if you're working on rhythm guitar, that's a great place to go next. If you're learning scales and want to learn to improvise, I'd go for the B string next and work my way down from there. The main reason is just that when you're improvising, your target notes will tend to be on the top three or four strings. And if you can get good at identifying roots on those strings, you'll have a much easier time hitting chord tones. In method three, we moved along one string using the cycle of fourths or fifths. And that is the advantage that each note is five or seven frets away from the last one. Another variation you can use to test yourself is to move across strings using the chromatic scale. This has a similar effect of keeping you moving up and down significant distances on the fretboard. So let's switch over to the chromatic circle and start on the B note at the seventh fret of the high E string. If we want to play a C on the next string, there's one at the first fret. Then there's a C sharp at the sixth fret of the G string. There's a D at the twelfth fret of the D string. D sharp is at the sixth fret of the A string. And E, of course, is the twelfth fret of the low E string. Now, if we start moving back up the strings, there's an F at the 8th fret of the A string. F sharp is the 4th fret of the D string. G is the 12th fret of the G string. G sharp is the 9th fret of the B string. And A is the 5th fret of the E string. If we keep going, A sharp is the 11th fret of the B string. And B is the 4th fret of the G string. C is the 10th fret of the D string. C sharp is the 4th fret of the A string. And D is the 10th fret of the E string. Once that exercise starts being easy for you, you can confidently say that you know the notes of the fretboard. One big takeaway from all of this is that it's not necessary to master all the notes of the fretboard before moving on to other topics. In my opinion, the best way to learn is cyclical. And that's because a lot of topics in music theory build on each other. For example, triads are built on root notes, pentatonic scales are built around triads, and the major scale modes are built on top of pentatonic scales you don't need to treat that as a ladder. Instead, treat it as a loop, and each time you touch on a topic, your understanding will increase. Start with an E note and learn it everywhere. Then use that knowledge to learn E minor pentatonic everywhere. Then use that knowledge to learn E Dorian everywhere. When you're ready to move on from that, learn A everywhere and repeat. Use the rectangle and stack approach from my other video and mix it up between minor and major pentatonic. You don't need to learn all of the modes at once either. The Dorian mode combined with the minor pentatonic and the Mixolydian mode combined with the major pentatonic are the most useful sets of scales for blues-based music, which includes almost all of rock and roll. And my Hidden in Plain Sight video shows you how they sit on top of the pentatonic scale. If you'd like a compact written summary of the concepts covered in any of my videos, there are printable PDF cheat sheets available for sale at the link in the video description. Your purchases are the best way to support development of future fret science videos, and I thank you. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons. See you next time.